Cowabunga, dudes and dudettes, welcome back to your favorite podcast at the intersection of faith and fear, where every week we discuss what scares us in order to find what saves us. This is a very 80s fear of God. Speaking to you right now is one of your fear of God hosts, Nathan Rouse, and typically with me is fellow co-host Reed Lackey, and he was here a minute ago, but he slipped out of frame, and I just heard him say, I've fallen, and I can't get up. (laughs) <laughs> i hope he'll be on his feet again in time for the show in the meantime allow me to welcome you into our totally righteous series a break before things get heavy again a series where we're going to be celebrating that era some of you may not have even been born in but that birthed such fads as slap bracelets and glow worms mm-hmm. when the times were strange and the things were strangers grab your oil and saxophone and come join those fogging 80s <laughs> we, we, uh, <laughs> We have three, count them, one, two, three party guests today, a trio of Teenage Mutant Masters of the Universe. Yes, friends and foggers, please welcome first, Sydney Prescott's number one fan, Jackson Harper. Second, se- second, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's lovely. <laughs> lovely to have you back, Jackson, and in so quick a fashion. Uh, next is that bastion of German 80s fantasy fandom, Dave Courtney. Get it? And last, but certainly not least, is Chief Chirpa's right hand man, Ian Olson. That's a deep, deep 80s cut right there. <laughs> Ian, <laughs> Dave, Jackson. Go see if you can rustle up Batman number 14 while I remind the listeners that here at the Fear of God, we explore. We don't explain, except for right now when I explain that you can listen to The Fear of God at your nearest podcast platform. You can watch The Fear of God on YouTube, and you can browse The Fear of God on the web at thefearofgodpodcast.com, where you will find Reed. Reed, you're here. (laughs) The Iceman cometh, and he is Reed. I feel the need. The need for podcasting. It doesn't have quite the same yeah, ring to it. Sure. But, you know. You well, know. you could have said the need for Reed. It was right. Ooh, there. Oh, it's right there. You know what? What are you guys even doing? <laughs> <laughs> the, we don't the know. Need We're for st- Reed. still figuring that out. Just <laughs> I am here Reed, to fulfill the, the all need. here. Yeah, absolutely. Man, it is so great to see you guys. This is a, a real treat. This is a blast. Honestly, don't know exactly how much substantive conversation we're going to have, but I'm sure there'll be a lot of laughs Zip. and we're going to have a lot no. of fun. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> None whatsoever. Not a bro. <laughs> <laughs> not a bro. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's awesome. Uh, real quick, before we get into anything of super possible substance, it's business time. Anybody yeah. got some business they need to attend business. to? Any prayer requests, you know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I do yes, read you, sir. I, the... I, I, I do have a note. So I, that, um, I know of two <laughs> things that we have to hit. Uh, so I'll hit one of them and then okay. you can you can hit the other one. Uh, the one I'll hit is just we want to say a very, very big thank you to those who are staying attuned to the podcast subscription feed. Uh, last week, last Friday specifically, we had an episode, uh, a bonus episode interviewing the author Grady Hendrix. We want to send a very special thank you out to Grady for spending a little bit of time with us. And of course, his book, as a reminder, the Final Girl Support Group is coming out actually like the day after this releases oh look at that look at that look at that so um to celebrate that that's a very 80s thing is trading cards a little it is it is and um so grady was kind enough actually to give us a little bit of swag um that that yeah that he said we were more than welcome to uh pitch out to some of our listeners so uh nathan do you want to sort of take the baton and tell listeners how they can get aviators (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's like three of you um, have been amazing if one of you just had a pack of these on hand and could catch it in frame That'd be amazing. Oh, what was your man. question reed what no do you want to take the baton and tell people how they can earn one of those cool little uh final girl sure, reed, hand cards me the that... baton. <laughs> you, you can tell it's been a day you sir um, in the booth y- yes we in the spirit of the content of this book which again uh is called the final girl support group if you couldn't hear reed over my shenanigans uh mm-hmm. uh We're doing a little contest for the next six weeks. We're going to keep plugging this to you. Um, Plug us uh, on your socials with your favorite final girl 
And uh, if it's a film we've covered, tag that. Go to the, no, none of that. None of that. We are live. <laughs> you, sir, in the breakfast club. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, for the next six weeks, the Final Girl Support Group uh, 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 contest, uh, <laughs> let us know your favorite Final Girl, the film that that character shows up in. If it's an episode or a film we've covered, go to the blog, pull that link, post it to your socials. We have to know that you've posted this. So, you know, tag us in it and That's you right. get entered for a chance to win not only the possibility of a Final Girl support group uh, a trading card set, maybe there's some bubble gum in here, um, but also a Final Girl support group book. That's a mouthful, Final Girl yeah. support So the grand pri So you're all gonna, I'm automatically going to be entered. Grand prize is going to be a copy of the book and a copy of the trading cards. Uh, we also have a couple of other packs of trading cards to give to some runners up. So Jackson, you partially helped inspire this with your advocacy Ooh. for Sydney Prescott uh, on your well, episode. that's the so. correct answer. <laughs> so, hey, you should, hey, listen, I know you're well, you on go. the episode, but you should Win go to some your social cards, media bro. feed and you should, you should uh, declare that again and tag the show okay. and then enter in for the, uh, you know, for the contest. So, um, so that was my the, main bit of business. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, there, there's one more. Do you want to share it with them or do you want me to? Well, humorously, I'm not totally sure what you're referring to. So, um. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead. So listen, we're all about the partying right now. For the next, for the summer, oh, we that, are partying. Yeah, uh -huh. um, but if you go a couple of weeks back, we also told you what the next wave, the last half of the year is going to be. We've already received a couple of submissions to this end, but we spent the first half of the year talking about what scares us as we do on every episode and as we're going to do this whole year, we're going to spend the back half of the year talking about what saves us. So I'm not going to go into all of the details right now. Go back and listen to the mini-sode where we kind of break down what the vision is for this mini series. Sode. The mini-sode. But by all means, please submit to us. Go to the fearofgodpodcast.com. Click on the banner on the top. It'll take you to the submission form. Those of you who submitted for what scares us, you'll do the same exact thing. If you didn't submit for what scares us and this interests you a little bit more, please go do the same thing again. But this is for what saves you, what's giving you hope, what's saving you now, whatever that means to you. Again, listen to the episode for a little bit more unpacking, but submit those to us. That's going to be the coverage that's going to cover the back half of the year. So we'd love to hear from you. Like I said, we've already received some, but please, uh, when the 80s party uh, series is over, we're going to be diving right into that. So send us your submissions. That's my- I say, I say from here on out though, all guests must be in costume, you know, uh, oh. regardless of whether it's party time or not if you're listening to the episode today uh if you're listening to the episode you should you owe yourself uh the favor of going and checking out the youtube because we've got you know a breakfast club member as mentioned uh three of us are in uh some version of aviator sunglasses one of us is my density uh lorraine uh, <laughs> we've got a black sabbath fan uh, what, isn't that what it was, Jackson? Black Sabbath? Well, yeah, but I'm more like, I'm kind of a lost boy, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the metal, you I know who you actually metal. look like right now, and it's also Jeff from Hansen. the 80s, is is what? Jeff <laughs> no, no, no. You look like, I don't remember the character's name. You look like the lead singer of the River Bottom Nightmare Band from Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. Wow. Oh you wow. Absolutely. <laughs> with the denim, the denim vest, with the high collar. The, the bottom nightmare man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this is delightful. Oh, yes. I haven't thought about Excellent. that in a while. Well, hey, there you go. You're welcome. <laughs> that is yeah. awesome. Ray Ray, you want yeah, to wait? Us to wait, Hawkins? wait a what? minute. What? You forgot about Marty McFly. And no, I said my density. I was referring oh, to oh, yeah. I got it. I got yeah, it. Yeah, see, I didn't no, leave he... you out, Lorraine. Yeah, but he Nathan dances with obscurity. He he wants you to. He's like the Dennis mm. Miller of podcasting. He wants you Good to pick day. up on the references, like super super <laughs> low key, deep cut. You know. So, um, all right. So that's not that low key. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay though. It's a great McFly you got going on there, yeah, butthead. You are you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome oh my god like two days ago back to the future part two was randomly on the tv and i, I watched uh -huh. the whole thing because i just i caught it in about 20 minutes in the middle i love that movie um all right so uh before we get into our big main coverage uh we have a little stopover in hawkins to do so let me formally uh bring us in <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen it is once again time for us to venture off 
into the upside down. Hopefully not stay there too long, but uh, more appropriately check in with all of our disparate quests and side hustles that are going on in the city of Hawkins. All of our characters in Stranger Things Season 3, specifically Episodes 3 and 4, for coverage today on this week's Hashtag TV Guideposts. Welcome to it. Delightful. Okay, so I have to ask... Uh, we did this last time when we sort of inaugurated everybody in. I'm just going to kind of go around in a circle because I need to know kind of where everybody stands. Nathan and I don't have to repeat our sort of standing on Stranger Things, you know, that's been well covered on the podcast before. But Dave, Mr. McFly himself, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, what's your what's your history? I, I know that you and I have have uh, discoursed before on uh, Facebook about like your your general sort of concerns around Netflix. So I can understand how Stranger Things might fit in a particular bubble for you. But I'm curious what your landscape is for for this particular show. Uh, do you like it? Do you not care for it? What's your thoughts? It's a show that uh, you would think I would really like, but I'm sad to say <laughs> it's not my cup of tea. I'm glad Andy went first last. It was Andy, right? Last <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. glad he went first because he kind of paved the way for, for me. I feel like I might even be more down on the show than he is. But Interesting. Okay, yeah. cool. Cool. Well, we welcome all. Fun times uh, ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, we welcome all opinions here. Um, if your internet goes out unexpectedly, don't be concerned. We'll bring you. We'll bring you right back. <laughs> um, Jackson, I'm coming to you next. What's your Stranger Things history? You like it? You love it? You hate it? You whatever? I don't watch it. I saw. <laughs> I saw the first couple episodes when it premiered a few years ago, and I wasn't that interested in it. I did not continue mm -hmm. watching it, and. Uh, only today did I venture into two random episodes from the, third, <laughs> from the middle of the third season. So You're like, I'm just going to watch these without. I was, I was rather confused. <laughs> so <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, Abs absolutely. That's about all I have on that. All right. All right, but at least you saw these two episodes as part of preparation for the podcast, and that's dedication. I did watch those two episodes. <laughs> some thoughts cool cool actually i am okay so this okay. is gonna sound this is gonna sound a bit patronizing it is in no way patronizing you? i actually am very curious oh shut your mouth <laughs> so um i am very curious to hear the thoughts of somebody who has literally only seen like a couple of episodes from the show the way that we always used to engage tv shows before you know like yeah. in these days where you can get dvd box sets and everything streaming in bulk and you can binge everything it's interesting back in the day shows used to have to catch you with a random episode in the middle of season four just because you were scrolling past and that's how they would try to hook you in so i am genuinely curious when we get into it what's your well, what's your thoughts i didn't are on start it. watching buffy the vampire slayer until the beginning of season six Six. Oh wow! Deep and then it right. became one of my favorite favorite shows. So it's very See? possible. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Stranger um, things have happened. Oh, I see what you did there. See what you did there. Wow. Um, okay, so Ian, uh, I'm I'm I've been friends with you for a while, and I actually don't know the answer to this question. What's your Stranger Things feelings? What are, where are you generally with the show? Now, I'm at where I don't know if I like the show because I want to like Stranger Things after its first season or if there's actually something there that's really good that I'm sticking or that that is pulling me back or if I'm gotcha. or if it's like how I kept seeing Michael Bay Transformers movies like maybe this one will be decent <laughs> yeah. oh, that's a bitter bitter comp there <laughs> I was about to say like like or, or like Star Wars it. movies you know at like, one well, point they I'll, will get this right right <laughs> hey I'll try Rise of Skywalker you know so <laughs> Yeah, it's well, the old wrong uh, pod. Wrong pod. It's the old Bill Hicks joke about the two mosquito, the the two moths who are on their way to the sun, going, "It's gonna be worth it, okay? It's right. gonna be worth it." So, yeah. um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Take yeah, you. it's like that one. Take you a second. Take you a second. Um, okay, so we are here talking about episodes three and four of season three of Stranger Things. For anybody who wants to know all of our myriad thoughts, uh, check out the previous episodes uh, on Stranger Things season one and two. No need to go into all of those right now. But um, so episode three is called The Case of the Missing Lifeguard. It picks up plot wise with some of the threat that we've been seeing where Billy's been sort of um, uh, infected, if you want to call it that. They use the term later in the series uh, flayed 
where he's kind of been possessed by the mind flayer who was exclusively a part of the upside down the gate opened and it had kind of remained uh in hawkins a remnant of it had remained in hawkins from some of the events of of, of season two um so I'll, I'll share sort of my initial thoughts on it um i i really like these pair of episodes but it was interesting to me i mentioned sort of in setting up everything lots of side quests Lots of uh, this group's going to go over here. We're going to track them for about 10 minutes. This group over here is doing this. We're going to track them. Um, and that's one of the things that I really enjoy about the series in general and it, its energy around um, the way it takes its time to layer certain things together that seem utterly disconnected. It seemed like they would have no substance connecting together. And then by the end of the season, whether you like the way they do this or not, they've, they've kind of collided all of these different things together uh, for a big, hopefully fun and, and energetic payoff. But I really like that. This, this pair of episodes, uh, specifically focusing on three for right now, because we'll get four deserves its due, spe specifically when it's climax. Um, but I really like this episode in general. I'm going to go first to uh, Jackson to just see like, okay, sh share some initial thoughts on like nothing but the episode to go on and maybe a first couple of episodes of season one. What were your thoughts on it? Like, yeah, just in general. Uh, well, I thought it was really interesting that at this point in the series, the group is kind of fractured because mm -hmm. you've got Dustin off doing his whole other thing. Yeah. Um, that's Dustin, right? The, yeah, the, you're right. Nope, the curly haired good. character. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't really know the characters names that well. And That's then fine. you've got Will. You're, is you're doing great to so present. far. So it's Will, Dustin, Mike, and then who's the other kid? Lucas. 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 Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got Will and he's really starting to resent uh, Mike and Lucas for like having girlfriends mm -hmm. or wanting girlfriends because, I, you know, as... They said he's not interested in girls and that's not their fault. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, for one thing, I thought it was just interesting that it was a very sort of character based episode. There wasn't a whole lot of, of like crazy, creepy things going on. Yeah. I would have... um, other than, but other than like 11, you know, continually, like, is she going into the upside down? Is that where she is in that black space? You know, that's uh, that's negligible. So the show, one okay. of the things that, despite my affection, that I would sort of ding the show for is the show hasn't done a fantastic job of explaining the rules around that sort of um, liquid, you know, black oozy I, space. It just made me enters. think of, what's it, the... Uh, the Under the, the skin. Of your hands. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was absolutely. A lot like that. Well, um, I, if I can jump in there, yeah, I feel like it's pretty defined as kind of the mindscape like it is not mm. connected to the okay. upside down. She can. But she's got to like hear some sort of white noise or something. Yeah, yeah. In order you to gotta get focus. into it, you got to focus. Okay. When you know, you. Jean Grey, okay. you know Emma Frost, all these. You got to have unless you're an <laughs> Omega level, you got to be able to tune the stuff out. You know. <laughs> yeah, I get. I get it. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dave, what were your thoughts on this episode? I know your feelings on the show as a whole are a bit negative. Is there, you know? What's your take on kind of what the show is building at this point? Um, I think uh, for me, like I, I really didn't like season two and season three is a step up in my yeah. mind. Um, I think the, the scope of it, that it, that you can feel it heading in that direction already. Um, yeah. I am not a big fan of uh, three specific characters and um, I, I might be unpopular for saying this, but uh -huh. I'm not a fan of, of Dustin. I'm not a fan of Nancy. I'm not a fan of Eleven. So those three mm. characters, I really struggle to connect with. Sure. But the character that I really actually connected with in this season so far, and I think she gets uh, even more of a role in episode three, is the the one who's leading the show at the mall there. Um, oh, Robin. Robin. Yep. Robin. Oh, she's super cool. Yes. I liked her. Yeah. I like her a lot. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I like that episode three for me, that was the highlight is that she's kind of like really stepping into, um, into her role. Mm -hmm. And we're getting to see a little bit more of her. No, I, I definitely affirm all of that. Robin is a highlight of this season in general, and she's a bit of a scene stealer. Maya Hawk, Ethan Hawk's daughter, is um, obviously very charismatic as a performer. Oh, is that who that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's Ethan Hawke's daughter. I thought she looked familiar. And I'm Uma. Just seeing, let's, let's, I'm just seeing oh, those two people. Yes, 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 <laughs> and, and Uma. 
Um, I was connecting the hawk name. I'm not trying to shortchange the beloved Uma Thurman. Okay, like wow, wow, you're coming at me with your aviators. I'm you, you, it's just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Patriarchy. Patriarchy. <What? laughs> but um but no she's she really is a very big scene stealer and i love the scene where she cracks the code like her just the energy around her mm -hmm. running into the center of the mall putting together uh all of the different you know parts of the tape that they've been able to translate i just yeah i i agree with you that's a very uh energizing moment ian how did you feel about this episode three um you know i I guess the character I most was with was Will. Mm. Because yeah. mm -hmm. like when I see Mike just like grossly making out, you know, I'm like, just play D D, &D is way more interesting than girls. <laughs> like this, which is also to bring it back to my Transformers riff earlier, what I found so implausible more than any other single thing was the fact that someone can save the world with giant robots but then is more preoccupied with girls afterwards. Like, I gotta, I gotta be done saving the world because I like this girl. Like, that's stupid. Yeah. You, you, My like, work here I is want, done. <laughs> Winston, no, I want Winston Zedmore to come in like, when giant robots offer you the chance to save the world, you say yes! <laughs> yeah, we are mixing a lot right there. That's, I, I, I love it. <laughs> it's an 80s party. I mean, that's, that's what we're supposed All to do. All the 80s. All the um, time. I, I remember taking specific note, the scene where, because of its presence, particularly in season one, when Will destroys Castle Byers, I had an emotional yeah. reaction to that. That's, yeah. that really- I did is, too, and I don't watch the show. Mm, That's yeah. how good that moment was. Yeah, I mean, the actor just sells <laughs> yeah. the crap out of it. It's, uh, <laughs> you really feel the buildup of how desperate Will has been to connect with his friends and he yeah. is he is admittedly the youngest of the group um but to feel that sense of i don't have my place anymore this was this was what i like you, your heart just breaks for him looking back at the photographs the things that he once held with such fondness and calling them stupid you know i think we've all mm -hmm. had that reaction where we feel like the glee or the joy that we once enjoyed about a thing um, has been somehow polluted or that it's been lost. And so we feel this confrontational energy around like, oh, we, we kind of despise who we used to be. And uh, yeah, I, I agree that that moment is incredibly well, they, powerful. <clears throat> they do a great job of of editing into that scenes from season one of them playing yeah. DVD. Yeah. And uh, one of the strengths of this show is because the cast is the age it was when it started and is now and will be you've got live documentation of that that growth of them physically and it, it's it's uh -huh. very gutting when it cuts back to these these little children doing the thing they love yeah uh, so no that's a, that's a really powerful scene yeah um nathan before i get your thoughts i want to pivot back to just one quick thing mm. uh that david said about like not connecting with the character of nancy i just want to I just kind of want to echo a little bit of that. Like I struggle a lot with Nancy and Jonathan, to be honest, that I, I wrestle with connecting to their plot line and the uh, ire that she receives at the hands of her boss and her, you know, that whole team of people who just put down her ideas, put down it. it that is one of the handful of elements that while it is sadly very believable, particularly for the time and particularly for her station, it feels a bit forced in this moment. Like she is absolutely bringing everything to the table. And it is true that in the real world, she would have been probably categorically dismissed. Um, but there was something about it that just didn't quite uh, gel with me the way that I wanted it to. Maybe it was that it hadn't quite elevated to the status where she had any real concrete data. It was all just speculation. Um, I get a little bit agitated with, um, I think her character is a bit underdeveloped in general because it is hard to know, besides just the general feeling of wanting to be respected and valued, which is a worthy thing, um, it's difficult to put a handle on what she wants as a character. I don't think she's as well-defined uh, as, as she could be or as other characters are. So I just wanted to echo a little hmm. bit of that well, before we move and, on. And, oh, huh, I, you, sir. <laughs> I just want to bounce off that quick because you know who really, really arrived as someone like worth caring about, worth investing in, vis-a-vis -vis Nancy, Steve. 
Steve is. Oh, no, I mean, yeah. come on. The be- he a, is the best. <laughs> he wonderful. is the best. He yeah, is I, the best. I, He's simply the best. Which, which one is Steve? <laughs> He's the Steve's, best around. Uh, Steve's Dustin's friend uh, also works at Scoops at Ahoy with Robin. Okay. Yeah. I, Every yeah, yeah, yeah. morning I wake up and I cry a bit because there's not a Steve for me to see that day. <laughs> <laughs> or that you're not steve uh, i know i'm not steve no I'm no you i'm a i'm affirming that brother <laughs> um <laughs> but i do i i don't know i um few characters in the show writ large are as fully realized as steve and as hopper but i, I actually am gonna go to team nancy uh for this oh. season at least i i do like the arc uh, and the and I said this last week um, with Asia and Andy is is I do think in general this season does right by its characters. Now, there's you know there there there's only so many Joe Curies in the world. You know, like right, like that's sure. a find. There's only so many David Harbors in the world. That's a find. So you know those are instances of perfect casting meeting uh, uh, excellent character. Um, but I like what they do with Nancy. I, to me, I know what you're saying. But I mean, I think I really like the connection that she and the mom make later in the season. I don't know. I, I feel like it's a well, a well, uh, well realized arc. You know, whether whether it's ultimately a necessity. I, and I'll put I'll put it this way: it's not an unnecessary puzzle piece, and that's hard to do with a show with a cast this big. Like mm, to be able okay. to make all the pieces come together at a certain point is challenging. It's why you have in shows past your your kim bowers and whatnot it's like you you lose track of how right. to make this character relevant to the to the overall piece anyway well and she and jonathan uh lead up in this episode to one of the show one of this season's first major that ain't right moments and that's the old lady digging oh, in the yeah. fertilizer oh, like, that's that is disgusting you know um sometimes you're just hungry <laughs> yeah yeah um <laughs> It so top, tops the maggots. Yeah. <laughs> so um, moving into to episode four, which I think for me is the first like I I really enjoy this season as a whole. I really enjoyed the as I mentioned last episode. I enjoyed the nostalgia of you know seeing everybody at the mall in episode two. That was fun, but episode four gave me my first sort of flavor of what I think the show does really successfully writ large which is just bring together this collection of supernatural paranormal kind of things with the kids combating it in a real way i think episode four has a a fantastic climactic scene it's called the sauna test um they start right out the gate with the the uh, another that ain't right moment the face sucker like mind flaying the parents oh that was gnarly yeah it's just (laughs) So I got to throw in, I was watching this with my kids because uh, it's one of the few things we cover that I can. And one of my kids was sitting next to me and in the middle of that scene, I took my hand and it was in the dark <laughs> and I stuck it to her face and I was like, yeah. no, she no. freaked out. It was great. Oh, well, of course she freaked out. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, not it right. Fun. It, that was ain't fun. Right. <laughs> it was fun though. <laughs> it's nice to be able to share those moments with you. Sure, kids. sure. Of course. Um, <laughs> Oh, geez. Um, Ian, I'm going to come to you first this time around. What'd you think of episode four? Any highlights, any, any particular moments stand out to you that you liked if you, if your notes were that specific? Um, I, I just liked um, Max's um, kind of taking center stage in so far as uh, having to do uh, the sauna test with, here's, here's my thing. I needed a little bit more because I already don't like Billy. So, oh, sure. Right. you sure. know, like, oh, no, he's possessed. You know, like, what if he dies? You know, and then I'm like, okay, it's Saturday. Then we'll <laughs> do something else. Like, I don't, <laughs> play I don't care. <laughs> like, that guy sucks. So, yeah. But, he was... but I believe that Max cares. Yeah. Well, and uh, uh, there you go. Yeah. And I think, uh, again, right. to echo to echo and affirm, Billy was a, just a ranked tool in season two. Like, he was completely. He's the manager away. of a tool department. <laughs> <laughs> He got from a Harbor store Freight. called okay. Rank Tools R Us. <laughs> <laughs> what we do, we just produce rank tools. That's all yeah. we do. And then you rank them. <laughs> and they're all the worst. They're all just get like the, the bottom. This one's of also the number 300. <laughs> um, 
But I do feel like, and it's not present in this episode, so maybe a tease for later. I feel like this season may be a bit forced, but I feel like this season does some work in its latter half to kind of bring a little bit around on Billy. But I agree with you. I think especially where we are in the show and especially with episode four, he's just the surrogate villain. And it, it barely matters that he's the one that is uh, is chosen, you know, to, to be that way. But um, so, uh, Dave, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, what what of this episode, good, bad, indifferent or ugly, would you would you say? Um, so <laughs> I don't. I uh, wrote notes down and I unfortunately didn't separate the episodes, but oh, I will okay. echo. Um, I really did resonate with um, the scene with Will that we already discussed. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. And I also really liked, as you already talked about too, um, the ending of, um, mm. well, it would be episode four. Yeah. Um, with, because uh, I think that's where the stakes really feel like they've really been raised yeah um and i can't remember which episode in it it's in but which one do we get the uh uh the dad bod from uh hopper oh that's Come uh on. that's three that's three, <laughs> that's three good old dad, yeah good old dad bod <laughs> from hopper though there you go it's awesome man he i was thinking that when he was i was like man he's he's so rocking the dad bod this was he's obviously pre animal. hellboy <laughs> right yep yeah <laughs> I but, need to be uh, cast at that point. <laughs> Shape up. I, I felt I felt <laughs> like that needed a shout out anyway. <laughs> oh no. Agreed and affirmed. Agreed and affirmed. So Jackson, our resident oh, okay. uh okay. oh no, you hand. want to go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. No, I'm just I'm our just guests excited. can wait. Why don't you no, go ahead? No, 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 they they can't. Jackson, you're you're so cool over there. What are you feeling? <laughs> well, for one thing, I want to see Nathan play Hellboy now. I don't, okay, I know. <laughs> if it gets me in shape sure the win. <laughs> but uh okay so this episode was definitely more of what i were was expecting from the show as sure. opposed to the third which was a lot more character driven and uh i don't know it was fine i guess i mean there's a lot of stuff going on i didn't really i don't know how it connects and i probably never will unless i go back <laughs> and watch the whole show it's all good. I mean, I just pretend it's yeah. Buffy. So, but uh, I was really surprised when Loki showed up. I thought that was a really bold crossover. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. you, uh -huh. no, you you were watching you were watching Loki on uh, Disney Plus, and it was not uh, it was not. I fell asleep. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, I fell asleep and somehow changed which streaming service I was. Yeah, doing. exactly. Was That's how they get you these days. <laughs> uh, so listeners aren't overly concerned. We polled all the 80s party guests to find out who the real Stranger Things fans were and saved them to the final the final one. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's all good. It's all good. We're getting a mix. Um, but it, it works. It works. I love it. Uh, I think uh, this fourth episode, partly I'm just excited because, I mean, y'all, a couple of you have alluded to this, but I'll say it with passion. This has one of the one of the best set pieces in the whole series is the yeah. sauna test. I mean, it yeah. is oh, exciting. That was good. I enjoyed uh, you, watching you it. You had your turn, yeah. Jackson. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, in, I'm, I'm party mode. Okay. Um, but, it's, but yes, extremely exciting scene. Lots of character stuff happening uh, to, I think it was Ian who said this. Yes, Billy, who is the manager and CEO of ranktool.com uh, in <laughs> season two, I'll give it to the show. They make me give a damn uh, ultimately about that character. And that is yeah. a, a no small feat to have done that uh, from what is just a two-dimensional Waluigi impersonation in the second <laughs> season wow <laughs> to full on to full on bowser Wally. in this one <laughs> but to, broader point being the sauna test is fantastic it is it is an mm -hmm. excellently choreographed scene that has real drama to it uh real action to it and real concern for your characters i mean that's yeah it's really well done and i think episode four delivers you know uh maya hawk has her, her praises have been sung but we cannot undervalue how great an inclusion to the cast is without erica uh lucas's sister oh i mean gosh. she's you can't spell america got, without erica oh, yeah. uh, and that is one of the best lines in the show goodness gracious uh she's <laughs> hysterical 
Uh, they yeah, give her some like great, her. Uh, <laughs> some great scripting. She delivers yeah. fantastically. I mean, she's Absolutely. she's great. Yeah, Dave had mentioned uh, about the raising the stakes. Like, I think when Billy, possessed of the mind flayer, grabs L and is choking her up, and she to this point is really the only one that stood a chance of actually hurting anybody and then she's compromised at that moment to the degree that even we didn't want it's not a discussion about the next episode but like she's hurt like they they take a moment of time to register that like she's been injured uh because of that and uh and so like talking about raising the stakes and raising the threat level i do think they do so in a really substantive way uh mike stepping in and then you know like cold cocking him to try to just create a diversion um that that whole sequence is just it's really uh, quite affecting and and quite thrilling. And I think that might be one of my favorite things about this season is that the threat itself takes longer than any previous season to really understand what it's doing. But along the way, they do a really good job of making you genuinely afraid. Like, oh man, this is this is bigger than they've ever had to try to overcome before. And maybe they maybe they don't make it out of it this time. You know, I think that I think that was pretty effective. Before we completely leave the episode, I have to show, particularly from episode four, a little bit of love for the scene when Hopper shuts the door to the mayor's office, locks it, knowing things so are about good. to go down, and so then good. has that oh. whole exchange with the mayor. <clears throat> that was Carrie Elwes, we sung his praises last week, but um He's a great addition to this cast. And I always happy when he shows up. Yeah, he's wonderful. And and that that whole scene that they have, I think, is just really, really strong. Uh, There's obviously some great stuff that builds throughout the season with with Hopper and his little adventures with Joyce. But but I really love that. The minute the minute. Oh, you know, Dread Pirate Roberts is like, don't give me that dead daughter crap because I just don't care. You're you. You look around. You're like, oh my god, this guy's about to get it. <laughs> I mean, it is intense it. and it delivers. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. He's signing up. You know, <laughs> where do I sign? Do. <laughs> <laughs> How many do I get? You know. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, yes. that's awesome. Yes. Um, all right. Well. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, and, and wind us down unless anybody has any strong objections. We all good? Okay. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that has been another stopover in Hawkins. Uh, no AV club, but we did visit a sauna, which was uncomfortable for all of us. And uh, we did visit the mayor's office, which was probably even more so. Uh, but we have, we're very grateful to our friends for coming by and sharing their thoughts on episodes three and four of Stranger Things. Join us next week when we will be covering episodes five and six right here on hashtag TV guideposts. Thank you, Reed. Ta-da! You're welcome. You're welcome. Nathan, you want to bring us into our main I do. content? I you do! do. You because do. we're talking about the Lost Boys today. Mm. And mm-hmm. quick show of hands, because I got a question after this. Who had not seen the Lost Boys? I had not. Anyone else? Okay, awesome. So wow. I was, I'm Michael, or Mike, whatever his name is, in this <laughs> scenario <laughs> you know. you're one of us now michael <laughs> <laughs> let go of the train tracks fall into the mist well isn't that isn't that what this show is it's just reed getting nathan to watch movies yeah <laughs> it is yeah, true yeah. it is true it's been and, a lifelong and... fantasy of mine i built an entire podcast <laughs> yeah yeah around it. it's like it's too late my blood is in your veins <laughs> uh, nathan is realizing that wasn't wine that we get. Oh, God. <laughs> it was exceptional. I am drinking wine, by the there way. You go. There you go. I've got yeah. to record two tonight. I can't for the first one. Or is um, it? <laughs> uh, so I got a question for us because I, I'll, I'll answer the question that Reed typically asks. And I, I actually, the further I get from this, the more I find myself just, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Uh, really great flick. But something specific about this film just really plucked a chord in my heart in my nostalgia heart and that is when these kiddos are at that comic shop flipping through the funnies (laughs) and one-upping each other on (laughs) issues and events i was like oh my god i love it so much (laughs) like like 12 year old me is right there with uh, uh, Corey Feldman and his really stupid vocal affectation 
Um, like, oh damn. my god come on that, that's absurd that's really dumb we'll come back to that but i want to ask you guys so here is your chance i'm gonna give you a minute to think about this this is your chance to shout out an establishment from your youth okay because the the boys wandering the comic shop on the boardwalk took me way back what is yeah. that place uh uh in this instance that's young me's safe haven um this is your chance to wax nostalgic about maybe the the comic shop or the bookshop or the music store that was your go-to place of comfort and safety in your youth. Um, I will I will kick off while you kick this around your own noggins. Um, I actually think I've referenced this place before, but fun, wild, fear of God uh, uh, or lost style connection points here. So I got into comics by way of some friends outside of the town I grew up in. And specifically, if you listened to, Reed, do you know, Beckley would know this, the episode where we read Jacob Hunt's The Ring, uh, What Scares Us? Uh, I think it was Pumpkinhead. I believe okay. it was Pumpkinhead. So <clears throat> circa Pumpkinhead, we read Jacob Hunt, who did the art for the show's The Ring submission. In his submission about his What Scares Us being The Ring, he references a gentleman named Brendan, who was Jacob's roommate. Well, Brendan and his brother, Justin, I grew up with, and they lived out of state. Our parents were high school friends. So like deep, deep way back here. Well, they lived out of town. So we would go visit them and they got me into comics. So coming back to my hometown and finding this place, it's called Columbus Book Exchange. And y'all, hmm. come on. Like it's the place you would walk in now as a 30, 40 year old, whatever, and be like, oh, it's a... It is a musty warehouse of comic books, but to 10, 11, 12, 13 year old me, it was just like this Mecca of just discovery and wonder. And I mean, I, I still have this like sense memory attached to yes, the scent of this place. It was musty. It was, yeah. I mean, there were, there were tables upon tables of, of comic books. This was not, you know, kind of the modern era where it's these tiny shops or whatever, which is totally fine, but, uh, or more collectibles based, this was comics and, and 40 years of them stacked in a, in a warehouse effectively. And he would always have, he, sweet guy, had a lot of, had a lot in common with the Simpsons comic book guy, not an attitude, <laughs> um, but he would have these grab bags and 10 year old me was like, hell yeah i'll give you <laughs> 10 bucks for like 20 comics i don't know what they're gonna be but that's the fun you yeah. know and and i just there's a there's part of me reed you referenced this about the mall conversation last week there's part of me that just our our we have so determinized our lives hmm. that that it just every now and then i'm like dad gum it just mm -hmm. go 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 find some wonder you know go go it's it's hard to seek that out you know because because mm -hmm. wonder is by virtue of its own nature uh uh surprising right you know you you, you, yeah. can't, you can't just manufacture it but you know at that era that adolescent era where for me it was this this place this columbus book exchange this the smell of newsprint and and body odor probably uh hey. but to me it was just like this is amazing. I love this place. And so, awesome. yeah, I'm shouting out Columbus Book Exchange. That's what the Lost Boys, these these young fellas hanging out at the comic shop made me think of. Anyone anyone want to go next? Something something that you're thinking about? We'll call on somebody. Put okay, on I'm going to call on Ian. He raised his hand. You, sir. I'm thinking of um, Slantrax video in Janesville, Wisconsin. Nice. Which is now a laundromat. Um, which like it saddens me so deeply um but it was where i would go to get gnarly vhs tapes to rent you know that when you know there would be like that styrofoam thing inside the vhs case that was on sure. display you know yeah and i would just see the art for like pumpkin head and class of nukem high and um there I, I'm totally with Nathan. We're like, I can smell it, um, the store, but also like picking up that box and and feeling like there was something about how the picture quality on the back of the case was always so inferior that made me feel like 
the gnarly gnarliness quotient of the movie is going to be all the it almost looks like it's a, a snuff film or something like when you look, look at how frappy the imagery sure. is on the back and you're like dude i gotta see this uh okay i'll hide it under my bed and then when mom goes to sleep i will watch this and that's really how i got my foray into i remember watching aliens the first time and i would pause anytime i heard something just like thinking like oh it might be it might be mom like walking through the hallway (laughs) and i I don't want her hearing a bunch of colonial marines (laughs) (laughs) um game over man game over (laughs) (laughs) that's just great man um and (laughs) My kids are asleep directly below me. That was brilliant. Um, (laughs) But Slant Tracks also had comics. And that was my primary hookup in Janesville for when um, Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror, and The Haunt of Fear started Mm -hmm. to uh, get reprinted in the 90s. Um, So it was kind of my one-shop, one-stop, like, horror shop, really. Um, And it wasn't far from the library, so I could go get some H.P. Lovecraft books, check out some, like, horrendous horrified movies and and get my horror comics and just be a really spooky person uh, i mean awesome. and and i saw the lost boys at this time too so like i wanted to be the frog brothers mm. you know like this was my <laughs> ambition in life that's so, awesome slime tracks video it. r.i.p oh that's awesome uh dave i'm gonna pick you all right hey i'm similar to you i i was inspired to go to my basement and dig out my um bins of comic books uh that definitely brought back memories of being 10 12 years old and my parents being okay with sending me on the bus alone to downtown winnipeg the wow. place where uh i i wouldn't send myself at 20 <laughs> years later um that was back in the day when that was like i could do a one two three punch i would go to uh the uh the local comic book store slash bookstore uh downtown and then i would hit up the uh old grand movie theater it was like a single screen but the old Mm. like you know the old theater style with uh gothic um uh, gothic decorations on the sides and that's where i saw back to the future too actually oh wow uh, yeah and then uh, obviously hit up the, the the blockbuster. So I spent a mm, lot of time at nice. Blockbuster. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. Jackson, how about you? Before I go, well, I feel like it's not going to be that interesting because it's also a video store. But hey, that's we're right. a bunch of movie nerds here. That's right. That's of exactly right. Of course, we connect to a video store. Now, <laughs> mine was so I grew up out in the country. You know, North Alabama, out in the sticks. And so there was a couple little video stores. One was right on the way home from school. It was a place called Video to Go. And I would go in there almost every day after school, after I started driving myself. And I'd be in there for sometimes an hour or more, just looking at the movies and trying to decide because you could get five older movies for five days for five dollars. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, all, all cassettes, of course. But then I would talk to the lady that worked there. You know, she was this lady, she was in her 50s or 60s, and uh, we would just talk about movies because, you know, she watched them all the time, too. She liked action movies, so we'd talk about action movies. I don't know. (laughs) She was kind of like my friend, I guess, (laughs) because I would see her almost every day because I would get five movies, but I wouldn't have them all five days. I'd have them watched in a day or two, and then I'd be back in there two days later to get five more movies that's awesome so yeah video to go in uh, oh. fife alabama that's New awesome slash, you were friends <laughs> I <was gonna> say. <laughs> <laughs> um that reminds so, me of uh inter- i'm sorry to cut you off no, interesting development when joe and ben, ben stiller tony wonder <laughs> <laughs> he thinks he's gay because he's never had a real friend before and he's like what am i feeling it must mean i'm gay <laughs> <laughs> like no this is just friendship <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh um so for me it's funny because i i was tempted to go to my first video store that i you know uh, frequented fast forward video but i'm actually going to pour a cold one out for the place that really brought that that love and affection out it was actually a retail chain but it was a small one and it was a retail chain called media play at the height mm-hmm. of their 
um, sort of popularity. They were they were founded in 92. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they've been gone probably 15, maybe 20 years now at this point at the at the peak. I looked this up beforehand because I, I had a heads up on this question. So I looked up beforehand that they had at their at their height of their popularity, they had 72 stores across the country. So not so big that they were everywhere but uh and but one of them enough, was in gastonia north carolina one of them was That's in gastonia crazy. and i yeah. remember <laughs> i remember how much like anytime i had some disposable money in my pocket especially as a teenager i would want to go down to media play they had books they had movies they had music um i bought my first bob dylan album when i was there which was hmm. uh my very first bob dylan album was actually a box set of his stuff and it just sort of kicked the door down with a bunch of things um and then one of the, my biggest purchases and i always think of media play whenever this comes to light is i would randomly nathan you're talking about like dis you know discovering wonder and stuff i would browse the graphic novel section i found a graphic novel by max allen collins called road to perdition it was a graphic novel hmm. I picked it up. This was before the film had even been announced. Like I picked it up on its first printing and then didn't hear until like a year later that they were making a film directed by Sam Mendes and starring Tom Hanks. But I always think about with fondness media play and just the discovery of little things like that. I always used to love everything that they had. I, I still have uh, an X-Files long sleeve t-shirt that I bought at media play probably 20 years oh. ago. That's yeah. awesome. No, that's that's so fantastic. Yeah, pour, pour a cold one out for that's all our, our favorite delights. Um, so before we get into like Lost Boys, like real, we did this last week uh, where we counted down the box office grosses of the 1980s. We're going to do a comparable thing every week, and this will be our last sort of little mini segment before we dive into the film proper. Um, so uh, recently, of course, the last maybe four or five years, Letterboxd, the film, uh, the cinephile social media site has become like the place to go if you love to track and rate and review movies. Um, so we're going to go through what Letterboxd has shown as their most popular and popularity to them means it is logged as in like users show that they have watched it or reviewed it. So what their most popular movies are for each year of the 1980s. We'll rattle through these really quickly, starting off with 1980. This is not box office hit. This is popularity, most seen. No, uh, 1980 is a little film you might have heard of called The Shining, directed uh -huh. by Stanley Kubrick. That is the letterboxed most popular film of 1980. Uh, 1981 is probably no surprise. It is directed by Steven Spielberg, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Nice. Uh, the first installment in the Indiana Jones franchise. Um, 1982, it is the Ridley Scott directed. There's a lot of good stuff in 1982, but taking the top for popularity, mm -hmm. at least among Letterboxd users, is Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Um, that is the most watched film from that era. 1983, which I believe was also the box office gross winner for that year, is Star Wars Episode Six: Return of the Jedi. That's the first uh, overlap with last week, too. That's crazy. It is. Yeah, it is pretty nuts. Now, 1984, I think, is another overlap because the most popular is Ghostbusters, which I think mm. was also the yep. blockbuster winner of 1984. Uh, 1985, I think another crossover because the most popular and most viewed film is Back to the Future, which already has seen a little, seen a little bit go. of on pod yeah. love uh, <clears throat> representing there. 1986 mm -hmm. um, is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Nice. Which does not You're surprise my hero. me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, 1987, a little bit more Kubrick love with Full Metal Jacket. That is wow. a, a very interesting film. I am genuinely shocked by the answer to 1988. Uh, it's also the first of these films that I have not seen, but 1988, most popular film uh, from Letterboxd users is actually My Neighbor Totoro, the uh, huh. Studio Ghibli film. Yeah. You haven't seen that? I haven't seen that. It's, I haven't seen a lot of It's really Ghibli. good. You yeah. have to see it. Dude, it's, it's yeah, at, good. at one of these points... <laughs> <laughs> Charles Nelson points, Riley over here. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to need to do a big Studio Ghibli sort of like like sweep because there's a lot of those that are blind spots to me. I've seen Spirited Away. Um, I've seen uh, something else from there, but I can't, I can't quite remember which. I'm going to need to do like an education on that. That's a big that blind feels spot like, for me. That feels like the Ghibli heads out in the world, like totally 
<laughs> crowd swarmed that one on Letterboxd. That it probably did. That's an well, interesting choice. Second place to that one is one that would probably be more. <laughs> Give us the Ghibli cut. No, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so my neighbor Totoro wins uh, hands down, but number two on that is probably the more expected winner from '88, which would be Die Hard, which is a, a much more sort of you know thought through kind of thing. Uh, but all props to my neighbor Totoro. Um, so 1989 uh, is also a bit of a surprise to me, though I've seen it and I know it was very popular that year. Um, it is not Back to the Future Part Two. As a matter of fact, it is Dead Poets Society. Dead Poets Society wow. is the most popular film for 1989, according to Letterboxd. So we thought that was pretty interesting. We're going to visit some other sites for future episodes, but that was just a little trip down the 80s uh, for your nostalgia pleasure. Um, you want to you want to kick this conversation about Lost Boys off off right? I mean, you want to kick it off really right? Let's do the it. Way, the way you kick it off really right is to talk about things that are not only just wrong, they ain't right. <laughs> That sure as hell ain't right. All right. So this is the segment that we go into, as we mentioned, things about this film that not only are just wrong, they are, they ain't right. So um, Lost Boys has quite a few things in there. I'm going to go to each of our guests. Um, remember, you're, you're, pick, you're aiming for the top. Okay. So what is your, we're going to have five of these, I guess, amongst all of us. So what is your, uh, Dave, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, as as our representative, uh, Mr. McFly, what is your number one from the Lost Boys? That ain't right. Um, can I include a personal story to explain please, why? Please. By all means, yeah, by okay. all means. So my that ain't right moment is uh, I believe it was a squirrel, a stuffed squirrel, right? That that's in his room staring uh, at yeah. him. Yeah, when he's ready to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back. This is a true story. Back in my band days, um, I took a tour out to the east coast of Canada. And uh, along the way, we were staying with different uh, hosts, different people. And uh, so me and the bass player got to stay with a, a couple that we did not know. And um, <laughs> so they invited us. And it was really weird, a really weird setup from the get-go. Uh, there was her and her husband was in this like really dark room sitting in a chair. He didn't say anything when we came in. He's just sitting there. And we're like, okay, that's weird. And uh, so we went through the whole thing and uh, eventually we were ready for bed. So it took me to where I was sleeping and nowhere will I walk into the room and the whole room is just decorated with um, McDonald's parent, like McDonald's uh, iconography, like these mm -hmm. little lamps and they're all lit up. Like every single one of them is, is lit up and they're all faces. And it goes literally made a circle around the entire room. What? And so <laughs> she- Did you grimace? The, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, she came in and she told me the one thing i was not allowed to do was turn any of those lights off no so i'm sitting there in the bed all of these eyes ronald mcdonald eyes and, and characters from the restaurant are just staring at me and i'm like what no. is this oh and the, the one thing <laughs> You can take a dump in the corner, but don't turn the lights on. Yeah, I was not allowed to touch them, and she made it very clear. Do not touch any of these. Oh, my and, God. And then the next day, she packed us a lunch, and she literally cut. A happy like, meal. She, yeah. no, no, she gave us a, a muffin, and she cut, she cut the tops of the muffins off and gave us the muffin bottoms. We didn't realize that until we opened the bag lunch afterwards <laughs> it's like <laughs> what you just cut all the muffin tops off and gave us the bottoms <laughs> there's a novel waiting to happen from that entire <laughs> you need to go right <laughs> find some microfiche of that area and that time frame that, that something happened after y'all left and it's not oh. <laughs> No, indeed. Because yeah. you know the problem with Santa Rosa or with Santa Carla, <laughs> I can never stomach is uh, all the all the hamburglers. <laughs> and and mental note for somebody who does not know the West Coast, 
trying to look up where it takes place is not going to lead you anywhere by typing in Santa Carla. <laughs> it's not a real place. Not a real place. <laughs> not a real place. We got to learn uh, about doing, Dave. Learn about doing. <laughs> um, Jackson, what is yours? Uh, that is not okay. the taxidermy squirrel in the room. What's what's your I had a, peak? I had a lot of choices because there's some really. So I've got to go. I have got to go with death by stereo. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's a good choice. Just, I, I, there were many worthy contenders, but I don't know. That was just like a nice little little button on the movie. <laughs> it is awesome. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> you think you've seen the best kill, and then all the kills are pretty great, but something about the way he's just convulsing and the sparks are flying everywhere, and he, he starts to all kind of melt. I it's just like it's so gross, and that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so it's got to be death by stereo. That's... Plus, they actually I thought the phrase death by stereo, mm. and then they actually said that said in the it. movie. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so, fantastic. A worthy worthy. And I've choice. seen the movie before, but it had been a long time, so I didn't remember. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. That was on my list. It wasn't at the top, but that was on my list. <laughs> Ian, what was uh, what what's what's your that ain't right moment? My most ain't right moment is when uh, poor Bill S. Preston gets staked. Yeah, uh, in the cave. That's rough. And yeah, then goos geyser. all over everything. And then there's yeah. glittery diarrhea spilling on everyone. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and Corey Haim is just taking it. He <laughs> 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 doesn't move at all. But oh my god! But what I love is how calmly. He tells his mom later, like, I have evidence on me. He, he look, look, look. Just like that. Like, look, see? Look at Whiff. Oh, my gosh. Glitteria. Yeah. Oh my Although God. What's, what's funny is I actually liked that because I feel like in movies often it's like the person falls in the pool or whatever and literally the next scene they're dry. You know, so I kind of liked the continuity yeah. there of continuity you know, guy gets <laughs> <some> serious kudos <laughs> um we don't have enough glitter oh, diarrhea on him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> touch him up between takes oh my gosh <laughs> that um, was rough yes yeah yes, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so i would so i would uh yeah i i just want to before we go into the next one nathan i'm coming to you next but uh -huh. i just got to say like i think the bill and ted movies and this are the only things I know Alex Winter from. Like, it's like I always think about right? whenever yeah. whenever I pull up Lost Boys, I'm always like, oh yeah, Bill's in this. Like I didn't realize I'd forgotten all about it before he was Bill. Yeah, yes. it, it's so yeah. funny. Like he gets the chunked out. Bill. Exactly, but no. The, so a lot of love to Alex Winter. Nathan, what's your what's your most ain't right that hadn't already been mentioned? Well, you know what? I'm thinking of thinking of making a little curveball here for you so oh, we, we've oh, got no. we, we've got no it's okay there's there's five of us here four of you are going to have an eight right so we've got what saves us coming and who knows we may we may incorporate something like this in there of 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 that's so right because there is a thing there is a just a mm, mm, mm. i know i already know there's where you're going compétent, you know something french yeah. some french word i don't know how to say uh of this movie that like like just just catapults it above the rest and you know it's not ain't right this is a that's so right there are a few things more right than a buff oily dude playing the saxophone at <laughs> a local carnival like a local thing like i am so enthralled with the story here what is i feel like that is exactly what i thought kinda, it's kind of like it's kind of like in in you know like um I don't know think think like uh uh in in a new hope obi-wan talking about that was the the dark times you know like this the story that's not meant to be told just suggested <laughs> like it's that it's like i want to know but mm -hmm. i don't want to know like because like what because led this man from a career in professional yeah, wrestling it's like yes to, it's to like we're talking about the wonder of discovery <laughs> like this this tantalizing thing that's just out of reach is the story of of, of oily dude and his and his extremely buff physique coupled with a rather skilled saxophoning right well and he's I mean, got a this... he's got a maple syrupy voice too like his voice right. is actually That's really nice he is yeah, perfection given form 
and <laughs> the chain you know necklace. is this a local <laughs> act in santa clara you know maybe when dave does his research on the real santa clara he'll find tell it, it's, of... it, it's like frodo overhearing aragorn singing about the ren and luthien and then like, oh, what's that about and then oh Tolkien's like well no, no. That, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that right now oh my god <laughs> It's one of my it's one of my favorite memes that social media has ever given us because I was so surprised. It's one of those things where like, you know, the the meme structure where it'll say like nobody, you know, it'll have dots right, and right. it'll have some punchline. Well, this one said nobody, dot dot dot. And then it said not a damn person, dot dot dot. And then it said the Lost Boys writers. You know what this movie needs? And then it's got all <laughs> I still believe like right there. Well, I mean, I was already kind of like on board with the film that I, I i like the general structure of it it's it's a bit uh um uh, a bit out of the box in terms of a traditional presentation of a vampire story so i liked that and we can get into particulars if we want but so i was already I, oh yeah so it's the it's the non-traditional vampire story it's kids in a comic shop and then it's bret hart you know uh just just like old up, ready execution. yeah he he, he retired <laughs> From, he's from more of a Shawn Michaels type, yes that's who I'm thinking of saying. yes yes yeah. great kid uh, uh, regardless I mean fill he in the blank it's so him. passionate he cannot contain his physicality as it's as amazing as someone as sign as that as guy as to a multi-record deal you know <laughs> or don't he is he is as much a mythical being in that town as these vampires are it's right. amazing he's a unicorn oh my god yeah, people are like yeah so you know, Mike, Michael is like talking to people, like looking for a job. And he's like, "You see that oil guy singing last night?" And they're like, "What are you talking? What are you talking about?" <laughs> it's just like this phantom that sometimes. Yes. yes. What the, there what was the no real one on stage last night? <laughs> what, what the real story is is that what it, what that really is is that's what Grandpa's really doing on Friday night. Yeah. Drink this potion. Yes. <laughs> it's poly juice. That. But like, but like you can buy you can buy his CD single that night and it evaporates by daylight. You know, yes. it's like yes. the sun comes up and it's gone and he oh, doesn't so show up until he. Bippity boppity buy like it's just <laughs> like completely evaporated. Oh my God! I'm so glad that you brought. That's amazing. I still believe that is so wonderful. So that's um, not that so right. I, I, you know what? It's it, it is. It's it's perfect. It's a perfect. It's, it's a good inauguration of the title. Oh, yeah. I I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, I will I will say not to bring us to somber a moment, but it is worth pouring out a cold one as of this recording. Uh, it was this week as of uh, broadcast. It'll be last week. We lost uh, a, a very talented and prolific director in Richard Donner. It is worth noting that Richard Donner produced this film. So pour mm -hmm. uh, a cold one out for, for Richard Donner and his, uh, his inclusion here. But my number one, that ain't right, has got to be friggin' them handing. I love Chinese food. God knows mm. I love oh. Chinese mm. food. It's, it's, <laughs> it's my favorite. It's my favorite. But, not, but then if there's anything that threatens to undermine my affection for Chinese food, it's the whole sequence where David is handing boxes of glorious Chinese food. I, I love that scene in the movie any movie where, oh, you want to order some dinner? And then they've got just the, all those little takeout boxes. And I always have the same thought where I'm saying, oh, what's in that? What's in that? Oh, man, you got some, you got mm -hmm. some beef chow mein in there? What? Oh, you got some, some steak fried rice? What is that? You know? And so, but then when he hands it to him and he's like, you're <laughs> eating maggots. Pay attention to get automatic buy-in from Reed. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's it. That's all you need. Just open with the with the Chinese takeout boxes and I'm in. Um, but like he's he's like, he's the, the whole thing where he's like, you're eating maggots. And then he looks at it and it's worms. And it's just like, oh, it just, that ain't what, right. What I love right. about that moment is you've got Kiefer just selling the hell out of his prop. <laughs> It's like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. I got my chopsticks. I got, you want some, Mike? <laughs> you know, and it's like, you, you're not, you don't know what you're doing, do you? <laughs> Nobody it's like, noodles that it's way. It's like I, I read a story one time about Hugh Jackman, you know, being cast in something in particular, I can't remember, but it was like, can you ride a horse? And he was like, yes, you know, it doesn't matter. It's like, you know, you just say yes, because you want the role. It's like, they said to Jack Bauer, like, can you, can you use chopsticks, sir? And he's like, oh, I guess. <laughs> but then you watch him in that scene, you're like, that, br that brother does not know how to use chopsticks. At least his voice is different than from Dark City. Oh, oh, I thought oh. that. Oh, thank God. Agreed. <laughs> I was Agreed. ready. 
<laughs> oh, man. So, um, so I think that I think that is a, a th enough said about the Chinese food that wasn't really Chinese food. So, Andrew, take us out for another installment of That Ain't Right. That sure as hell ain't right. All right. Um, I enjoyed that immensely, immensely. Um, so, yeah, like, uh, what do we want to what do we want to talk about with this movie? I think maybe before we I mean, I, I'm going to I'm going to open the floor if anybody has any particular like uh, any questions, anything they want to to take note of for the next, you know, 30, 40 minutes here that we're going to be talking about this. Um, this is a, a favorite film of mine, uh, at least from this era. It's one of my favorite vampire films. Uh, it's it's many a Halloween season. My wife also loves this. I've, I've referenced on the show before that the intersection of horror film horror themed films or horror films that my wife will actively like i don't need to you know leverage a favor to say like hey sit down and watch this with me lost boys is on that list she enjoys lost boys um so so yeah like uh speak up someone what's what's somebody got to say about this film well i tell you the reason that i wanted to talk about this movie it was my number one choice for me yeah. to talk about is because i didn't like it oh yeah show yourself yeah, up like that well <laughs> but here's the thing i hadn't seen it in 10 15 Jackson, years you learned too much from that lady friend of yours and i know non-recommendations <laughs> i don't know i just thought it would be an interesting conversation if i was talking about a movie i didn't actually like but here's the thing That's i fair. watched it again today in preparation for this and i really enjoyed it it's like <laughs> i was really wrong <laughs> jokes on you <laughs> i was like because I think when I, I think when I first saw it, uh, maybe you know it was ten, fifteen years ago. So I wasn't looking for the same things in a film that I necessarily look for these days. Yeah. And so I just, when the movie starts, and I remembered it just being this like corny '80s thing with like corny music and like the, the sexy sax man and all of that, and <laughs> and but then what like the movie starts man? and it just yeah <laughs> <laughs> then the the movie starts and it just assaults you with all this style there's all these mm. like swooping shots and like the camera's doing all this crazy stuff and the colors are nuts and you can yeah absolutely tell it's from the same director as batman and robin <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah it just really turned me around on it i still think it's kind of stupid but in a fun way at least yeah, it's it's so. very fun. You talk about the stylistic thing, man. Mm. I am immediately in the mood for this movie every single time. And so, Jackson, we did not do a what you're watching, reading, listening to segment. But listeners, uh, stay tuned to the end of this episode for a little bonus clip because Jackson graced us with a wonderful little rendition <laughs> of of what you're watching, reading, listening to. Uh, but that I am immediately in the mood for this movie every single time the opening credits here, and I hear that 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 drum beat. And yeah. the, the really sort of, yeah, yeah the sort of uh, undercurrent of Cry Little Sister sort of breaks in. That is a really mm -hmm. cool song. And it it's immediately, a cool song. Yeah, it puts me right in the framework to, to see this film. Um, Ian, you're nodding, giving some love over there. What do you, what do you, what do you want? <laughs> I mean, The Lost Boys really captures for me. I first saw it when I was, I think I was eight, um, is what I told Chris <laughs> and, I, and I think that's mm. correct. But it was on it was on TV, so it wasn't quite as gnarly. Yeah. But it was mm. still something an eight year old probably shouldn't watch just yet. But nevertheless, <laughs> I just immediately loved it. I already, um, I already loved uh, like anytime uh, Looney Tunes characters had to encounter some creepy thing. Those were my favorite episodes, and um, I just found the Frog Brothers so. It, it this I'm sure this sounds really goofy, but I was like, yes, that will be me. So <laughs> I I mean I'm the guy who had to go to the principal because my, I took wooden stakes and garlic and crucifixes in my backpack. Oh to no! And, from school. <laughs> and like some Just kid knocked over my backpack one day. Clink, 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 out of all, all these wooden stakes. Oh, no. Oh, you're so a vampire the hunting gear. Yeah. And, <laughs> and unfortunately, I was already a smart aleck. So the principal's like, Ian, what, what's this about? You're like, so what do you I, think? Was, I was like, For you. sir, come on. 
<laughs> the jig is up. About. The jig is up, principal. It's like you we're both grown ups here. Let's <laughs> let's just shoot straight. You you know why a man has wooden stakes and hammers and garlic in his backpack. <laughs> so he didn't take that very well. He said, Don't bring them back again. It's like, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> no, um, no problem. No problem. But I did you I, ever go into a church and get the holy water out of the I never had the gumption. That was a great that was a great always, moment in the movie. I love that scene really so fun. much. I always knew if if worse came to worse, push came to shove, like I knew where to go to stock up, but no, I never knew. <laughs> but I think that it never it never actually seemed scary to me. Like hmm. there were enough things in real life. And, and this is what I told Kristen last night too, when I watched it with her, um, her first time seeing it, I said, oh. family stuff was way more horrifying, but like hmm. vampires, I know the solution. I know how to get rid of it. I know how to take <laughs> care of that. Hmm. So I, I, that's not scary to me. So yeah. I, I feel almost like there was kind of an initiation in a way in watching the Lost Boys, like a door was open, but but then I wasn't abandoned to it. Like there was a walking through and a and an, and an apprenticeship mm. via the Lost Boys. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, this is one of, uh, I would say one of my two, like one of the two most important vampire films of the 80s that have that like neighborhood flavor. Uh, I would, this one and Tom Holland's Fright Night, yep. which is a film I absolutely love. Uh, both of them kind of cut from the same cloth, different, very different stylistically, but both of them kind of cut from the same cloth yeah. uh, tonally and everything. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally, I totally feel you there. Dave, uh, what you got for us on this film? Some love, some affection, some critique. Well, definitely the nostalgia factor. I, I immediately got taken back to um, my initial connecting point is the younger brother, um, mm -hmm. obviously with the, the comic book store, but just the, the whole uh, arc with him. Um, I mean, he still is my favorite character watching it now, uh, uh, despite the fact that I'm much older. But I mean, now I really get to appreciate it. I mean, it's, it's still a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. And really stylized um, and, and lots of iconic moments that just kind of like pop back into your mind very easily. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, well, I, told, <laughs> I told you guys already the story about trying to track down the book because um, that was one of the nostalgic pieces for me is it took me back when I realized the same author who wrote the book, adapted it from the movie, wrote the book for Back to the Future 2. Mm. and uh mm. so i immediately wanted to track down the book because i that's one of my favorite childhood reads mm. and um uh but i couldn't find it anywhere and turns out because they made so few copies of the book that uh it is now um a collector's item <laughs> and uh i'd have to fork out a lot of money i mean upwards of five thousand dollars apparently from what i was seeing <laughs> and Man. uh so that yeah that I, that got me curious to look up the Back to the Future two book because I actually own it. <laughs> turns oh. out, turns out uh, I found a copy on uh, online that was selling for five hundred bucks. <laughs> Only wow. when I went to look for my copy in the basement, turns out I accidentally gave it away to the library when I was downsizing oh a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Support your local library, kids. Support your local library. I mean, you don't have to do what Dave did. I mean, you don't have to go that far. <laughs> yeah. no. but, but support your local library. You know, it's funny, before we get too far away from that, there was a like a niche market for a while, and I think they're still out there, probably much more rare, but novelizations of the popular films have been a thing for like a really long time, since like even the 70s. Um, and it's it's funny, I would be really curious how many like major blockbuster films are out there that had a, a small run of paperback uh, adaptations uh, that were in novel form. And I, I, I would be really fascinated to find it, but just to like browse through the 80s and see for uh, when it was an original film, not an adaptation, but when it was an original film, something like a Back to the Future or a Karate Kid and see if there are novelizations out there. Cause I bet, I, I bet they exist. Yeah, I'll, Did I'll you add. see, oh. No, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, Dave, and then we'll come to you, Drake. Well, I was going to say, I, I, I'll add, too, that I actually tracked down a, a copy, a digital copy of the book. So I bought it for six bucks for, <gasps> like, the digital. So oh, I actually wow. got to, um, I read it before mm -hmm. I, I rewatched the film. And, wow. Uh, nice. <laughs> so I got to, 
add that to the experience. And that's awesome. No, that's fantastic. I'll have to seek that out. I was, what were you going to say, Jackson? I was just going to trivia. Did you see that Tarantino has released a novelization that he wrote of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Yep. I've already got anyway. I've already got the audio book on hold. That seems with, interesting to me. Anyway, yeah. Let's get into there. Yeah, no, no, no. I've uh, I already put the audiobook of Tarantino's novelization on hold at uh, at my library service. Yeah, okay. I'm very curious to read it. Um, so Nathan, your first time seeing this. I mean, any any particular other things stand out to you? You were the you were the only one of us who had never seen it before, and you've already sung its praises quite a bit. But uh, yeah, you but guys yeah. handed me some Chinese food, and I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down. Gobble it up. <laughs> Scarf it down. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, I, you never know what you're getting into with these flicks. And so I was like, okay, you know, Lost Boys. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and no, I was very taken with it. Um, uh, uh, Jackson referenced the stylistic aspects of it. And I, that I really responded to, you know, those I kind of loved um, that you, uh, what it made me think of that was so poorly done was in storm of the century the flying scenes mm -hmm. i kind of mm -hmm. love that you never get you know some really bad looking flying scenes with right mm -hmm. jack bauer and crew uh as vampires and instead get these really kind of cool uh uh you know helicopter shots i suppose yeah um, although there was one scene late in the movie and maybe there's more than one i just this one stood out to me real particularly i think it's after they i can't remember what has just happened but there's an away from the cave flying shot, but it's mm. moving away from the cave. And I was like, I thought we were supposed to have their vantage point here. Are they flying backwards? <laughs> this is a really cool mental image here. Is <laughs> them just flying backwards and looking at the cave as it drifts off into the distance. Um, yeah, that joke didn't land. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, I was, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think you know, uh, for even as like predictable as it is that what's his face becomes it is kind of who they thought he was. Um, yeah. I liked the way it was it played out. I, you know, if I if I'd had my like, trying to predict the movie lens on which I didn't, I probably would have seen the Deus Ex grandpa coming, but I didn't. And so it's kind of fun when it happened. I was like, all right, that's cool. <laughs> everybody's got a role to play. And that's it. I dig it. Yeah, so no, was actually, it was a lot of fun. It was stylish, um, and I enjoyed it. I was actually going to ask you, and I mean, this this can kind of filter after you answer into a question of the broader group. Um, you've already answered this, but I was curious if you um, saw the reveal of him being the head vampire coming, because um, I'm always curious when I watch that film or when I know people are watching it for the first time if they're going to pick up on that and how predictable or not and the reason i'm saying that is because the very first time i saw it admittedly i was younger i was probably like maybe eight or nine years old when i saw this uh for the first time i did not see that coming so like the big reveal at the end i was uh quite taken with i, I didn't predict that that was going to happen um so i'm always I mean, curious it, to see if people yeah I, I again if the movie doesn't play itself as a mystery film. And so mm. from that standpoint, I'm not really trying to forecast certain pivots, but right. Um, right. you know, clearly they keep referencing a, <clears throat> excuse me, a head vampire or something. I don't remember the, the verbiage, but, um, and the, the, I did notice when the gentleman who I can't remember the character's name, but when he ushers Kiefer's crew out of the store at the front end, there's mm -hmm. a, I noticed the familiarity of it. And so that kind of lingered with me. Um, yeah. But I really loved that how they throw you off the scent is the, well, you got to invite me in moment. Cause mm -hmm. yeah. What, what it reads as is just a cute vampire convention nod. Uh, when in fact it's very in story what's happening yeah. there so so no i really enjoyed that and and it um it wasn't so much that it was like oh my gosh it's really him you know but it, it <laughs> right kind of process of elimination gets you there sure did anybody else i mean like i don't know i don't remember how young we all were when we saw this i know there were different age groups connecting with it but did anybody else never ne not see that coming upon a first viewing i i knew 
it was coming. And mm-hmm. I, I, this was another talking point I, I had with Kristen last night. I think that the Lost Boys helped. I, I think that I have an uncanny ability on one site to know if a person is a douchebag or not. <laughs> like, show, show me a photograph. And I'm like, that guy sucks. And then people are like, oh, get Ian, give him a chance. And then nine months later, I was like, that guy sucks. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I think that, again, I said it was an apprenticeship. I think the Lost Boys ushered me into, Ian, you will have second sight. You will see the sexy sax man when others don't. <laughs> and you will know that Max is the head vampire when others don't believe you. Oh, but he's Max. so nice. No, he's not. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> look at that guy nobody trusts that guy well and then when he goes full vampire i was like you really look like a, a rank tool you know he, he he's like his, i love he's like he's like the cfo like, he's like the cfo of ranktool.com yeah <laughs> i also I have to love say, that though, edward herman is my favorite person in the movie like i just love he's him great. as an actor he is never not just just so enjoyable to watch but no, he's so. he's he's very charismatic. Uh, I mean, side note, apropos to nothing, but any audiobook uh, fans, he's a great audiobook narrator. Like, oh, I don't I even care. I don't even care what the book is or what its subject is. He has got a fantastic cadence of delivery. Uh, so mm-hmm. I, I'm very, very fond of Edward Herman. His reading but, of Das Kapital is top notch. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Amazing. I mean, there, yes, it was it was one of my childhood, uh, you know, affections. <laughs> so um, but but I do think that that lends itself to something, you know, we're 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 not the episode is not going to last l- that much longer but i do think there's something interesting around that character and i'm going to bring up something that um hopefully i'll frame in a question that is not just self defeating but so obviously he was doing this toying thing where he's just like okay uh, you have to invite me in invite they invite him in and he's rendered powerless to all of their little tests you know he can raw garlic he's visible in mirrors holy water has no effect all of that simply because he's been given this you know tacit invitation to actually come mm-hmm. in um, but one of the things that stands out to me that's interesting uh, Nathan referenced Deus Ex uh, grandpa there uh, I do think that line is a great last line where he's mm-hmm. like, one thing I couldn't stomach about Santa Carla is all the damn vampires. And <laughs> I think, but what's interesting to me about it is the way in which this doesn't have to expand too much, but the way in which grandpa is clearly normalized to a very abnormal thing. Mm-hmm. And he does admit, you know, he does say like, yeah, I, I couldn't stomach it, but he's just living his life. And one of the things that took me by surprise this time around is the realization of like, it's kind of cutesy in a first viewing to be like, oh, grandpa knew the whole time. He knew all about this. But this time around, I was sitting there. I was like, holy crap. Like, grandpa never said a word, like never said a word about the fact that there was all this going on. Like when they came to visit, everything, the weirdness going on with Michael, like never said a word. Like he was so normalized to it. (laughs) <laughs> that he goes through, kills the head vampire, and his first action is to go and crack open a cold one from <laughs> the fridge. Like, that's how normalized he was to it. And I From have his to special say, shelf. Right, from his special <laughs> shelf. And I got to say that gave me... the second shelf. No, not at all. Not the Oreos. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> but, like, I got to say, without getting too too heavy, that that gave me a bit of a chill of just the way of, like, wow, even in this cutesy little thing... He was so normalized to the, the, all of these massive murders. And it feels like the town really is. So, like, it feels like writ large, even the Frog Brothers, you know, have a comic shop there and they're just like, hey, this will save your life. Like, you're us, you're talking, <laughs> the vampires you're talking about. That is like, clearly this is such a, a normal sort of Well, I mean, sort of you rhythm. talk about them normalizing things. Look at, you know, Unicorn Johnny playing the sax <laughs> up in here. They're like, <laughs> I would Thunder normalize is to all that. around them, both. Yes both you know of the wicked variety and of the sublime variety (laughs) well i mean you look at the town i I feel like we always end up talking about whatever town the horror movie is in at this point but like yeah santa carla that's a wild town sure like the opening montage you just see all these people in the town and it's just like a wild place sure and there's this big you know like 
it's like amusement park in the middle of town <laughs> that apparently attracts all the seedy elements and everything and sure. it's just like it's just a crazy place to live in general and then on top of that of course there's vampires why right. wouldn't See, there what's, be right yeah <laughs> what's funny about that reed and and i know you're you you, you make an astute and poignant <laughs> poignant excuse me point um but that's one of the things i really liked about the film is mm. it's not about is this mysterious character possibly a vampire of ancient <laughs> origin who's preying upon hapless victims? It just, no, nah, man, this is this is what we got going on in this town, and you know, you yeah. got to figure out how to how to you know live or or, or not. Um, hey, love so it or leave I, it, pal. Yeah, I mean, it's like no, don't get me wrong. There must be some sort of grand tourist draw to this town that it even still exists as a town, given all of its you know the, the guy elements yeah exactly. he's roll him out he's on get the him map. out you know tourism's down let's get let's get saxy out um, bring out oily but We're not closing the beaches <laughs> i love that it's oily and saxy you know <laughs> but point being i kind of like that about the structure of the film which is just you know mm. it's kind of a given and now it does beg the question of why lucy is utterly ignorant to it but mm. You know, she's been away for a while. I think, sure, I'm re remembering correctly. But I did, yeah. Um, but it, it did. It yeah. Go it's ahead. Weird yeah. because she is prototypical. Well, she's not prototypical. It, the eighties have already been going on for some time. But mm. I mean, she's every stupid parent in every eighties movie. Mm. Who, who like? Oh, you mean to tell me this is going on? Come what, what, what? on, you know, right? And <laughs> and um. I mean the kind the kind that we mocked when we were talking about it. Um, hmm. She does not take anything her kids have to say sir. Well, she does drive home in a panic immediately um, when when Sam is saying Michael is flying outside the window. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna kill me, mom. He's gonna kill me. <laughs> she just abandons ship. Yeah, but but you know what? Once the explanation, I couldn't help but think of Salem's Lot. And I, I think about the mm -hmm. Callahan, like, well, but if, if this is a reputable person who doesn't lie, and it's also um, the uncle in Narnia, right? Like, well, but if she doesn't lie, then wouldn't the most rational explanation be that she's telling the truth? Mm -hmm. So I just kept thinking that, like, and, and Thorn, Thorn, like, viciously attacking you, destroying the gate in its... Oh, it's that was almost you. my, that ain't right. <laughs> right? Yeah. That was intense. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's... I, it does feel like a Ferris Buellerization of normal adults because she is the only normal adult. Grandpa is definitely not normal. Max is the head vampire, and otherwise we have no adults in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. We, we do we do have some unaging young adults, mm. but like Wilford Brimley, never grow old, never die. Yeah good old cocoon i think yeah. that like i think that's the thing and then dave i'm going to come to you to to share your thoughts on this as well that like i think that's the thing that is just maybe there's a broader lesson in this or maybe just a uh, worth you know a, a, a tip of the hat to is just that understanding of yeah like grandpa and mom and th like they could be doing so much more to dissuade what michael gets involved in uh but at the same time it's like you think about the ways we sort of shrug our shoulders about like oh yeah i mean things are gonna happen life you know it's not quite the gen generalization of life ain't fair or whatever but just like yeah this is just life and it really just struck me that some atrocious wild abnormal things can get egregiously normalized to the point that you just then you know, like I mean, embrace. The, yeah, yeah. I want yeah. I want Dave to talk, but it's like you know, <laughs> we got we got a bunch of really poor piss poor gun laws in America, and our kids get getting shot up. Eh, it is what it is. You know. I mean, and that's kind of vampires in Santa Clara, right? There's a certain de there's a certain Carla. degree to where yeah, there's a certain degree to where that's where my <laughs> head is going, and and you know, like pick your pick your political or social poison. It's just like then when the thing comes that that should be should be and this is what drives me crazy is when i start talking about to people 
either in one-to-one conversations or I start talking to people about uh, when this more frequently happened earlier, uh, you know, like a couple of years ago on social media, we start talking to people about like, well, yeah, we need, we need to fix this problem. And then when people would begin to say like, well, this is, this is reality, you know, you're not going to fix this in reality. And I keep wanting to say like, but that like, it's a reality that we created, like we brought ourselves here. Like this is something that we've, we've, over time, we've manufactured to produce ourselves here. So why wouldn't we try to sort of re-steer the ship if we could, or at least in subtle ways? And maybe it's just worth saying, and again, Dave, I really am, literally, I'm going to shut up in a second. I'm going to let you talk. But like that, that is one of the things that just sort of maybe the, tr- the, the true term is haunts me, is what is in my life right now that I have normalized as just collateral acceptable atrocity um that is you know that that is plaguing my spirit plaguing my home plaguing whatever um that i've just that i've just normalized to and i might i might give it lip service i'd be like yeah i never could stomach all these damn vampires but that's (laughs) like like what are you doing i I don't know dave you don't have to directly respond to what i'm throwing down i just really just want to hear your thoughts on the whole thing uh yeah like the that is definitely a big part of what I noticed from the, like going from the book to the film, because the way the book is structured is you get these um, different perspectives. So it's constantly shifting from uh, between the three characters. So the older brother, the younger brother and the, and the mother. Mm. And um, Mm. so you're just constantly bouncing back and forth and you, you get equal time with each of these characters. I'll say that um, like the book is, is, a lot more character driven and focused on this kind of like being transplanted into um, foreign territory mm. kind of um, narrative, right? Like this, this new town where you don't know everything um, and you, you don't know anybody and you're trying to figure things out. So I, I started to pick up when I read through the book, I started to pick up on this kind of like, it almost felt like it was an allegory for, um you know just kind of feeling in those the, those younger years mm. um you know being pulled pulled away from your familiar world and placed in somewhere new and having to figure things out and just kind of more focused in that direction whereas the movie you really do get more of a sense of place like right off the bat this sense of like it's familiar it seems real obviously because i thought it was real <laughs> um <laughs> but it's not right. And then this, like, it's, it's this weird tension that plays through um, I think the entire movie. And I think it's pretty effective because like, as you guys were saying, you, you start to get into the film and it's just like, the further you get in, the more normal this all just kind of seems, even though you, you know, in your mind, like none of this is normal. Everything's over the top and, you know, from the uh, the older brother's weird um, uh, attractions and the development of that whole relationship to the crazy grandpa to all these characters that seem a little bit off and yeah, of course, you know, and and that really does come to light in 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 the movie more than it does the book. So I think sure. they do do a good job with. Um, with that and I, I can see where you're going with that you know mm. as far as like translating that into a, a real world experience you know trying right. to make sense of that against uh, a world that maybe sometimes feels a little bit closer to that than we want to admit <laughs> yeah we've just we've just lived with the vampires for too long if I can not to put too fine a point on it like there's just a lot of vampires that we've just lived with for too long and and because we've lived with them so the, the lives they take, their presence in our town is um, is kind of just a thing. Hey, yeah, watch out for that. You know, yeah, watch out for that because that happens. But, you know, but it, it's just it, now it's just part and parcel of the whole picture. And I think that's uh, that's truly quite a haunting experience. Um, I want to sort of open the floor real quick for kind maybe last call. Last call at the comic shop, you know, like, uh, you know, in the la- oh. in the next like, uh, <laughs> in the next like uh, ten minutes or so. But I, I just want to give the floor to if there's anybody who has anything burning, either to respond to what we're already putting down or something else they want to bring up. I, I want to give the opportunity to do that. Ian, I, I see that hand. Yeah, 
I'm, I'm responding a lot to what you're saying right now because times past when I've watched this, it's that line has been kind of a crypto kind of moment, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Whereas like watching it with my wife last night, we were both like, what the hell? <laughs> like, right, right. <laughs> um, yeah. Because it would be one thing if it was like, yeah, man, Santa Carla will kill you. Vampires everywhere. And you got to watch your back. Mm. You, that'd be one thing if it was like, yeah, vampires are real. Mm. But it's so flippant and casual. Like, man, vampires is crummy. And mm. and your grandson has been at death's door for part of, part of my problem is I don't know how long it is because he seems to come back the first night and mom's calling. But she's also referencing like, you stay out all night you sleep all day it's like so this isn't the first day like right, i don't know right. how long this is all taking place that's a good point yeah um but yeah i mean if, if grandpa was knowledgeable about this phenomenon uh, um and 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 was a concerned actant um in what transpired that'd be one thing like okay we should heed what grandpa has to say because mm -hmm. he's weird but he also knows what is transpiring beneath behind the veil of what is normal yeah of course but it's not that he's he's telling you his weird rules he wants his tv guy not rolled up mm -hmm. and he's very he's very self-centered mm -hmm. yeah i absolutely. mean it's the way he even talks to his daughter like you know most people come out of a divorce they they come out ahead, you know, but not you. It's like, oh, God. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> like, like, what? Why, why are you moving here? Are you that desperate? Like, this yeah. like he yeah. feigns death on his front porch because. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, yeah. and, and yes, Nathan, you called it the, the Dave's ex grandpa, but this, like, I watched it last night. I was like, why is he driving into his own house? Yeah, that was <laughs> there's puzzling, no, for sure. There's yeah. absolutely no reason for that to happen except we got to kill. Richard Gilmore somehow. Yeah. So well, that or, how does he know he's not going to hit the people he's not trying well, to hit? Well, here, here's like, the how better. Does he know he's going to hit no the idea. right person. Here's the better <laughs> in-universe explanation. He just his foot slipped off the off the brake, you know, or he's a little too tipsy, <laughs> and uh, you know, three drinks in or whatever, and, <laughs> and uh, he's just like, oh, um, that worked out well. <laughs> yeah, he didn't, uh, he didn't even know he was saving up. the day. Yeah, he, he was just like. Trash can man, like <laughs> 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 so funny. Um, all right, before we go to the fog meter, anybody else have any final thoughts, last notes, anything of that nature? Anybody just got it? Say, I, I just want to say, I'm I'm a big fan of garlic, and there's a lot of wasted garlic in this film. There's too much wasted <laughs> garlic. I couldn't agree more. Too much. Too I much see all garlic. that. I see that delight just sprinkled all over his spaghetti and pasta sauce. And I'm just like, yeah, it's it absolutely couldn't, couldn't <laughs> yeah, agree Yeah, then more. it doesn't even work. I know. It's such yeah. a waste. That was okay, the did, did, did I get that quote right? Did, did, did they say, try holy water, dead breath? Is that how it goes? Uh, I don't I remember that, that line. Yeah, I don't no? remember that line. Try, okay, try I, holy water. Huh? I'll have to go back dead, and look at it. Try holy water, dead breath. Dead that's what i wrote down that, that feels right that sounds yeah. right that sounds wow. like a line that would be in it's this movie <laughs> maybe, it's, a, maybe. it's a very it's a very fraud brothers water, kind of breath. statement yes. the voice <laughs> what is that <laughs> oh yeah what what on like, earth is he doing <laughs> he misread his script and was like swallowed a frog brother <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna talk like this the whole time <laughs> purse my lips like this um all right so let's let's take it to the fog meter the uh patent pending metric our very specific metric of fear and god where we rate the scares and the substance of these films so i am gonna go uh first believe. off uh -huh. I still believe I'm going to still uh, I'm going to go first and foremost to Jackson. Um, so uh, what would you give the Lost Boys on a scale of one to ten on the fear measurement? Um, OK. It's not scary. We talked about this last time I was on the show. I don't really find movies that scary, but sure. it's so stylish and like the kills are really good and there's a lot of good set pieces. So I am going to go with a seven. All right. Ian, what about for you? Fear measurement for Lost Boys. I'm going to copy and paste what Jackson says. I like it. 
I like it quite a bit. Dave, how are you feeling? Fear measure. Going, going, going with the seven based on uh, how much <laughs> some of those images, uh, especially the one hanging off the bridge, kind of stuck with me from my childhood. So, yeah. Um, I am riding the wave. I have drunk the yeah. wine. I am, I am on it. I am joining everybody with a seven. Nathan, how are you feeling? What you thinking on the fear measurement for the Lost Boys? Um, well, I mean, I feel like an extreme <laughs> amount of vampiric peer pressure going on here. So seven it is. <laughs> seven. Seven. seven is the clearly the it's uh, too objectively late. My correct. Blood, your blood's in my veins, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll let you set the trend next time. What would you give it for the God? uh measurement nathan um well what y'all unpacked i'd give it a one you know <laughs> i mean it's like wow <laughs> there is there is unintentional substance in the opposite direction but the unicorn being the glorious beast it is is going to bring that back up it's going to trot right back up with its glistening body and hair uh to a six all right okay that's so how the vampires win Yep. Six for you. Um, I will go to Dave next. Dave, what are you giving it for the God measure? Matter. Measure. <laughs> what are you giving it for? The, what are you giving it for God? <laughs> for the measure, Gator. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'll go with the five based on this stuff that came out in this conversation. Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can I can feel that. Ian, what are you feeling for the God measurement? Uh, I'm going to give it a seven. Um, right. And it's because... It is because the holy water is effective regardless of the actant who is employing it. All right. That when is... it is blessed, <laughs> it is going to slay those vampires. <laughs> that, is a, that is a worthy Sunday morning post. Um, Jackson, what are you giving it for God? Um, I mean, it's a fun movie, and, and y'all are real good at, you know, wringing blood from a stone on this show. <laughs> <laughs> but... I don't think this movie has a whole lot on its mind. I'm going to give it a yeah. four. All yeah. right. No, I think that's fair. And I, I do, I do think it's the kind of thing where it, it, more than anything, it's just, it's just sort of there in the ether. I'm, I'm going to give it a five for my own measurement there. And I think that uh, kind of solidifies for me that it, it, it's not trying to be a very thoughtful film. I think there's some things stylistically in it. Um, and certainly it's text of the film that we're using what we have danced with substance wise. Uh, we're just using as, as text of the film. So it's there, but that means that we generally give the lost boys directed by Joel Schumacher, a six out of 10 on the fog meter, which is a, a reasonably substantive showing going to do a quick. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It does feel right. <laughs> uh, going to do a quick round. Robin, would you recommend the lost boys? Dave Courtney, Dave Courtney, would you recommend the lost boys? I would, but stay away from the sequel. It is oh, I mean, <laughs> the tribe. <laughs> I mean, haven't even seen the sequel, so I'm going to affirm that just just on your recommendation alone. Uh, Jackson Harper, do you recommend The Lost Boys? Yeah, sure. Fun. <laughs> Go ahead. It's a good time. It's a good time. I yeah. mean, I wouldn't recommend it to my mom. But... <laughs> Understood. But yeah. Understood. That sax player, however. <laughs> I would recommend him to my mom. Yeah. Ever, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> call call him up, mom. You're gonna love this. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm gonna send her the clip on YouTube later. <laughs> Just watch it. It's amazing. Not gonna be there. Fantastic. <laughs> um, Ian Olson, would you recommend The Lost Boys? I'm not sure we can be friends if you haven't seen The Lost Boys. All so right. Nathan, I'm glad that you glad to I'm glad you're the one of us. There. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. you are now one of us. So um, uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Nathan, would you recommend it? First timer? Absolutely. I thought it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah, cool. I'm going to echo what everybody else has said. I think it's a really fun time. I think it's a great, like, it's a great, like, spooky movie. If you're ever in the mood for something that's probably not going to be too obtrusive, not going to be too heinous for your imagination, it's a great kind of creepy movie. A uh, lot of fun. Uh, huge nostalgia factor. So, yeah, big recommendations all the way around for Joel Schumacher's The Lost Boys. And that concludes this next installment of the 80s party here at The Fear of God. I want to send a very, very special thank you to Jackson Harper, Ian Olson, and Dave Courtney for joining us for this wonderful uh, conversation about Stranger Things and lost boys uh this has been just a tremendous amount of fun for me nathan as always thank you so very much next week 
We're going to be doing this party again. It's going to be a different group of, of folks, uh, but we're going to hopefully have just as much fun because we are going to be talking. Uh, if, you, if you thought Lost Boys was out there, then stay <laughs> tuned next week for none other than killer clowns from outer space. So, uh, have, uh, <laughs> please. So, yes. yes, please. Um, so tune in next week where we're going to be talking about killer clowns from outer space. As we say on every episode, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but not the end of the conversation. And in that spirit, we encourage you to fear nothing else and be on your way rejoicing. Thank you very much, fellas. Really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, listener. Thank you, Nathan. We'll see everybody next week. See you guys.